right a very good morning to you guys today we are going to talk about nuclear chemistry and i know that i have not been making videos for a very long time and uh, not a very long time a long time and the reason is now phd work is catching up then there are a lot of other stuff that is happening around in my life right now so i'm just not getting enough time to make videos but uh, trust me on this i love to make videos for you guys and uh, i'll try my best to make videos as regularly as possible right so today we are going to talk about nuclear chemistry like i said before and uh, we'll focus particularly on the bark exam because the bark exam is about to come and many of you are requesting videos on the bark exam as well so we'll focus on nuclear chemistry and bark exam at the same time for those of you who just want to know have, have some kind of information about nuclear chemistry for them also this is going to be a good video right so i'm going to tell you what all we are going to discuss in the coming few lectures on nuclear chemistry right so we are going to talk about the basics and the modern things that are happening currently in the nuclear chemistry what's the scenario right then we are talk going to talk about the nuclear stability okay all right what kind of nucle nucleus are stable what are unstable because these kind of questions are also examiner's favorite questions right then we're going to talk about alpha beta and gamma particles this is a very important topic we are going to talk about their properties as properties as well then we are going to talk about the kinetics of nuclear reaction another a very useful and a very important topic uh, from nuclear chemistry that is the kinetics of nuclear reaction okay and a lot of numericals are asked in the exam from these particular topics then we will talk about dk uh, dk schemes okay so there are a lot of questions particularly in the bark exam based on dk schemes there are a lot of graphs that are asked you know uh, the parent nuclei the daughter nuclei and uh, how will the graph look like so there are a lot of questions based on this as well so we'll discuss that them we'll discuss them then we'll talk about nuclear reactions that your that is your nuclear fission and a nuclear fusion and in the end we are going to talk about disasters that have taken place if time permits uh, what what kind of disasters have taken place in the uh in, in, related to the nuclear scenario right now nuclear chemistry or nuclear science in general is a very sensitive topic right because um, you know all of you know about nuclear reactors and nuclear missiles and all those things uh, that are happening in the world right now so it's a very sensitive topic not many people are allowed to do research on nuclear chemistry or nuclear reactions and uh, but it's 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 a really fun topic to understand it's quite easy and it's fun to understand as well so now let's just begin with nuclear chemistry now a uh, nucleus as all of you know comprises of number of uh, some protons and some neutrons so protons and neutrons together are called nucleons right so whenever you see this term nucleons that means we are talking about protons and neutrons together so the nucleus com com comprises of protons and neutrons right now earlier what was thought was that the protons and the neutrons are the elementary particles right uh, but over the years now the if you ask any particle physicist what is the most elementary particle that they have that they know of they would say that the most elementary particle that they know of is quark okay i'll write down it's quark q u a r k q u a r k so the quarks are now believed to be the elementary particles right so no uh, now no one agrees that protons and neutrons are elementary particles it is understood that quarks are the uh, elementary particles uh, the most fundamental or most elementary particles right and the quarks are generally comp are of four types okay they are of four types those these quarks are of four types right and uh, we'll talk about their charge as well so quarks have a fractional charge okay quarks have a fractional charge so there are two kinds of quarks one is your up quark up up quark and one is your down quark okay so the charge is associated only with the up quark and the down quark i told you there are four different kinds of quarks uh, and uh, the charge is associated with either the up quark or the down quark right so the charge of a up quark is plus 2 by 3 and the charge of a, a down quark is minus 1 by 3 and they can be represented as u u for up quark and d for down quark so this is the way to uh, to understand quarks okay so quarks are basically of four types i'm not going to get into the details of what four types they are but all you need to, you, all you need to know are the that quarks are the only particles with fractional charge okay they have a fractional charge uh, so up quark has a charge of plus two by three or i can represent it by u and down quark has a charge of minus one by three which i can represent by d so if i talk about a proton if i talk about a proton the proton consists of two up quarks and one down quark 
Now all of you know that the charge on a proton is plus one. So if there are two up quarks, so we have two by three plus two by three and one down quark that is minus one by three. So the total comes out to be equal to one. So a proton comprises of two up quarks and one down quark. Okay. And what about a neutron? If I talk about a neutron, uh, if I talk about a neutron, a neutron comprises of two down quarks and one up quark. Okay. Two down quarks and one up quark. That is, if I write down minus one by three, minus one by three, plus 2 by 3 so this comes out to be equal to 0 so the net charge on a neutron is 0 and that is why it is comprised of two down quarks and one up quark right so these, these are the modern trends that you can see in nuclear chemistry that right now the most elementary particles are quarks protons and neutrons are no longer considered as elementary particles so this is what i just wanted to uh, help you understand from nuclear chemistry right now i'll clear one fact that i am very sure that 50 at least 50 percent i'm saying at least 50 percent of you would not know so i'm going to clear this fact which is a very basic fact but many of you make this mistake if you want to represent a nucleus okay or if i want to represent a nucleus the correct way to represent a nucleus is whatever the symbol of that nucleus is let's say if you have hydrogen then we symbolize it with h if you have helium we symbolize symbolize it with he right so whatever the symbol of the atom is or the nucleus is we symbolize by let's say x then over here we write the mass number a and over here we write the proton number the number of protons that is z so z is the number of protons a is the mass number and x is the symbol of that particular nucleus so z is to be written in subscript and mass number that is a is to be written in superscript now many of you make this mistake they think that the a is the atomic mass or the atomic number they think that a is nothing but your atomic mass or atomic number but actually a is not atomic mass or atomic number it is the mass number a is the mass number okay and i know why you make this mistake because you think a is the symbol so if a is a symbol it has to be either atomic mass or atomic number but actually this a symbol means it's it's the mass number and what is the different difference between an atomic number and a mass number or an atomic mass and a mass number see atomic mass or atomic number is not it's never a whole number it's always a fraction okay i repeat again your atomic mass or your atomic number is never a whole number it's always a fraction because you define atomic mass or atomic number with reference to the weight of uh, 12c or 12 carbon okay so you define the mass of a particular element atomic mass or atomic number by with with reference to the mass of a 12c carbon atom right so that is why it is always a fraction whereas if i talk about mass number the mass number is equal to number of protons plus number of neutrons the mass number of a particular element is equal to the number of protons plus number of neutrons and that is why your mass number will always be a whole number it will never be a fraction right so i i am quite sure many of you did not know this thing that a is actually the mass number not the atomic mass or atomic number so if anybody says that a is your atomic mass or atomic number you have to correct them and tell them that a is actually the mass number because atomic number or atomic mass can never be a fraction right okay and one more thing sometimes it is also essential for you to represent the number of neutrons also along with the mass number and the proton number you also have to represent the neutron number so if you have to represent the neutron number what you do is simply write down the number of neutrons on the right hand side in the subscript so in, on the left hand side of the subscript you have written z that is a proton number and on the right hand side you can sim simply write down the neutron number so this is the way to represent a nucleus right now why is this representation important because the next topic is actually going to be based on this particular concept or in on this particular symbolism right now we'll talk about your um, classification how do you classify various kinds of nucleus or what what are the relationships between different nucleus so there are four relationships you need to understand right first one is isotopes so this one is the most simple and I'm I'm quite sure most of you know but still let me repeat it once again isotopes have the same proton number but different neutron number right so they have the same z value but different n value so they have the same proton number but different neutron number example if I take 1h1 2h2 
and 3H1. So these three are isotopes. They all have proton as one. All of them have proton number as one, but their neutron number differs. This one has only one neutron. This one also has, sorry, this one has no neutron. So I can represent by zero. This one has one neutron and this one has two neutrons. So you can see that the proton number, I'll circle the protons. The proton number in all these three cases is the same, but the neutrons are different. This has zero neutrons, this has one neutron, this has two neutrons. So these are isotopes. Same proton number, but different neutron number are called isotopes, okay? On the other hand, if I talk about isotones, if I talk about isotones, okay? Isotones are the exact opposite of isotopes. Same neutron number but different proton number. So they have the same neutrons but different number of protons. Example, again I'll take the same example. Uh, 2H11, one, one, right? And if I talk about these two nucleus, Okay, I hope you can see them. Yeah, so if we, if we have these two nucleus, right? So this has one proton, this has two protons. So the protons are different. But if I talk about the number of neutrons, this one also has one neutron, this one also has one neutron. So the neutron number is same, but the proton number dif is different. So these two elements are called isotones. Same neutron number, but different proton number. Whereas for isotopes, it was same proton number, but different neutron number, right? Okay. Now what next we can we study about? We will study about isobars. So now we studied about isotopes and isotones. Now we are going to study about isobars. What are isobars? So isobars are nucleus or elements which have the same uh, mass number but different number of protons and neutrons okay so they have the same mass number that is their a value is the same but they differ in the number of protons and in the number of neutrons okay this is really annoying because they have started drilling in something so i hope it does not interfere with the video i'll try my best that it does not interfere with the video but i've already filmed one video before and it took around 45 minutes for me to film that whole video and i realized that i did not switch on the power button on my microphone so that was totally my fault uh, but uh, anyway let's just continue let's just forget that i ate something i ate some parathas and stuff so now i'm energetic so i can again make the whole video i do not have any problem with that right anyway now coming on to the topic that is isobars so in isobars what happens is like i told you same number of uh, same mass number but different number of protons and neutrons for example if i take 14 n 7 mass number is uh, sorry the neutrons are 7 the protons are 7 and if i take the carbon 14 c 6 now if you see the number of neutrons are 8 the number of neutrons are 7 the number of neutron the number of protons are 6 the number of protons are 7 so both the proton number and the mass uh, the both the proton number and neutron number are different but if you see the mass number the mass number is same so because the mass number is same and the number of, number of protons and neutrons both are different it is called as a isobar right so this is an example of isobar and what about isomers what about isomers in isomers they have the same mass number, same proton number, same neutron number. Everything is same. Then what is the difference? The only difference is in their spin or in the excitation. One of the nucleus is in an excited state and the other nucleus is in the ground state. And that excited state can be called as a metastable state. Okay. So one of the nucleus, they have the same number of same number of protons, same number of neutrons and same mass number. But the only difference is that they have uh, they are in different spin states or in different excited states and because of their different excited states they have different nuclear spin okay if you want to know more about the nuclear spin then i would recommend you to go and watch my video on uh, calculation of nuclear spin where you will understand that why being in different states one being in the ground state and one being in the excited state why they have different kind of spins okay and uh, if you have to represent those nucleus with, which are in the excited state you just write like this for example if i talk about the cobalt nucleus so 60 co this is the cobalt nucleus if i have to show that it is in the excited state i'll just write down 60 m cobalt 
where this M st stands for metastable state. That means this particular cobalt nucleus is in excited state. And these two are related by a term called isomers, right? And they have different spins. They always have a difference in spins. So what kind of a question can be framed out of it? A question can come, what is the difference between uh, I nuclear isomers? Their atomic number is different. Uh, sorry, their, new, uh, their number of protons are different, their number of neutrons are different, their mass number is different or fourth option, their spins are different. So the correct answer would be that their spins are different, right? Okay. So this was all about isomers, isotones, isobars and isotopes. So this differentiation is actually very important to understand. And now we'll talk about stability, the stability of a particular nucleus. Right? What are the factors that determine whether a nucleus is going to be stable or not and how can we predict what kind of a decay will come out of a radioactive element okay? or a radio radioactive nucleus. Right? So the first factor is the number of protons and number of neutrons. So the first factor that influences the stability of a nucleus is the number of protons and the excuse me number of neutrons. For example, if Z and N that the number of protons are even and number of neutrons are also even then it is found that the nucleus is very very stable so all those nucleuses with even number of protons and even number of neutrons in general majority cases are found to be very very stable right so if you find a nucleus which has even number of protons and even number of neutrons then it is quite stable it's very stable all right uh, almost 95 percent of the times you will find it to be stable okay so all the, most of the naturally naturally occurring elements on the in the earth's crust uh, which have even number of protons and even number of neutrons are very stable right then we have two kinds of com permutation combination that is either the proton number can be odd or the neutron number can be even or the new uh, or the uh, proton number can be even and the neutron number can be odd these are somewhere in intermediate sometimes they are stable sometimes they are not right and the third one is if both are odd if the proton is proton number is also odd and the neutron number is also odd if this is the case then in most of the in most of the elements which have even number of uh, odd number of protons and odd, odd number of neutrons the element is very unstable right so if you are given four elements uh, in a question and you are asked which one is the most stable you have to find the one which has both number of pro both neutrons and protons to be even so if you find any any element with both protons and neutrons to be neutral or uh, to be even sorry then they are considered to be stable right and the one which is the most unstable will be the one with odd number of neutrons and odd number of protons right then what else what else uh, uh, what else what what else uh, sorry what else what is what anyway uh, yeah so i was saying that um, which which are the other factors which, which decide the uh, the stability of a nucleus the other factors are your magic number so there's something called as a magic number and again I will divert you guys to that particular video that I had made on nuclear spin because that will explain you the concept of magic numbers very very uh, simply very in a very simplistic manner right and you'll understand it well and you will not, not forget so if you actually want to know the concept of magic numbers I would recommend you to go and watch that particular particular video first and then come back to this video right now what are magic numbers magic numbers are basically if the number of protons or number of neutrons are equal to any one of the numbers that i write right on this board then that particular nucleus magically becomes very stable okay and uh, the numbers are 2 8 20 28 50 82 and etc one there's one more i think i'm not I don't remember it correctly so it's 2 8 20 28 50 82 these are called magic numbers and as you all know that there's no magic in science right science actually proves everything the reason behind everything right so uh, if you have the, watched that video on nuclear spin calculation on nuclear spin you will understand why these are the magic numbers or why uh, when nucleus have these number of protons or these number of neutrons they are extremely stable right so if if, if let's say we have an element uh, let's say any element with uh, total 58 total 58 uh, the mass number is 58 that means there are uh, or let's say the mass number is 48 
and there are 28 protons and 20 neutrons then it will be extremely stable because the number of protons are also uh, also following the magic number and number of neutrons are also following the magic number right so both of them are following the magic number and because of this it is considered to be extremely stable right so we decided two factors that is the number of protons and neutrons if both are even and then if they follow the magic numbers then they are extremely stable the third factor is something called as the n by z ratio okay something called as the n by z ratio now what exactly is this n by z ratio we'll look into it that is the number of neutrons to number of protons okay so for elements which have a mass number of 40 okay for elements with a mass number 40 like for example till calcium till your calcium 40 ca 20 till your calcium that is a mass number of 40 till here the n by z ratio is somewhere equal to 1 if the n by z ratio is somewhere equal to 1 then nucleus with mass numbers 40 or less are extremely stable for mass numbers greater than 40 the n by z should be greater than 1 okay so if you come across the element uh, till mass number 40 which has a n by z ratio which is very which is quite less than one or, or it's 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 a lot greater than one then you can say, say for sure that that particular nucleus is unstable similarly if you come across a nucleus with mass number greater than 40 which has a n by z less than one if it's n by z value is less than one that is the number of protons are more than the number of neutrons then the n by z value will be less than one so if you come across a nucleus with mass number greater than 40 where by n by z is less than one then you can say for sure that that particular nucleus is unstable not for sure there might be some exceptions but in general uh, if you come across a nucleus with n by z less than one which has a mass number of greater than 40 then in that case you can say that the nucleus is unstable right so this is one factor by which you can understand uh, the stability of nucleus okay now i'll take one example and I'll explain it to you how with the help of this n by z value you can actually predict that what kind of emission is going to take place from a particular uh, nucleus whether it's going to be a beta emission uh, whether it, whether it's going to be a beta minus emission or a positron emission right now i told you that this alpha beta and gamma particles i will discuss in my next video but uh, here you have to understand the concept of beta particles or beta particles whatever you like to call it um, you can I mean you're free to call it anything so uh, here you have to understand the concept very briefly and then in the, in the next video I'll explain you the concept of alpha beta and gamma particles in detail right but to understand this particular concept of n by z you need to understand what are beta particles right okay now let's uh yeah let's take one nucleus let's take sodium nucleus okay this is the this is a stable nucleus this is a sodium nucleus which is very stable so you can see the number of neutrons are 12 and number of protons are 11 so if i take the n by z value it comes out to be 12 by 11 which is somewhere equal to one not exactly equal to one but somewhere equal to one and this is very stable okay now i'll take two other nucleuses uh, one is mg and the other one is neon okay so this nucleus has sodium nucleus has a m by z value somewhere near one now if i take talk about your uh, n by z value of n by z number of neutrons by number of protons i might have said m by z in, in my previous uh, whatever i just said previously it's n by z n is number of neutrons and z is number of protons right okay so if i take about if i talk about the n by z of this mg it's 11 upon 12 right and if i talk about neon it's 12 upon 11 Uh, I might have uh, okay sorry might have made some mistake this is 10 upon 13 so this is 13 upon 10 so this value comes out to be equal to 
and this value comes out to be equal to less than one so this is somewhere this is less than one right this value is less than 1 11 upon 12 and this value this new nucleus has 30 neutrons and 10 protons so its value is around 1.3 which is greater than 1 right so it is not near the 1 this one is, is less than 1 and this one is greater than 1 so obviously they are going to be unstable but how are we going to predict what kind of emission is going to take place so first we have to understand that if the value is greater than 1 then that means the number of neutrons are more than protons so in this particular case in the case of neon the number of protons are more the number of neutrons are more than protons so if the number of neutrons are more than protons just listen to me carefully okay if the number of neutrons are more than protons and we are calculating the n by z value and we need the n by z value to be equal to 1 okay so we need the n by z value to be equal to 1 and we have more number of neutrons so somehow we have to convert those neutrons to protons to arrive at a value which is equal to 1 right so we need to convert some of the neutrons to protons so that the value decreases from 1.3 to 1 so what we need to do we need to convert some neutrons to protons we need to convert neutrons to protons okay and what about in this case where values less than one values less than one means the number of neutrons are less than protons that means we need to convert some protons to neutrons so over here we have to do the opposite we have to convert protons <coughs> to neutrons here we have to convert the protons to neutrons and in that case we have to convert neutrons to protons to arrive at the n by z value of equal to one now how can that be possible how can we do it if from this I do a positron emission, a positron, P O S I T I P O S I T R O N, a positron emission, which is represented by beta positive. If I do a positron emission, positron emission is basically I'm taking out the positive charge out of the nucleus. So if from a proton I am taking out the positive charge okay a, a proton is plus one positively charged if I take out the plus one charge from a proton it becomes neutral charge that means it converts into a neutron okay this is this is not exactly what happens but to explain you uh, in, a, in, in a simplified manner I am explaining you like that that a positron emission is basically emission of a positive po positive charge so if I am emitting a positive charge that means I am taking out charge from the proton and I'm, I'm extracting that charge from the proton so if I extract positive charge from the proton it becomes neutral charge and a neutral charge basically proton is nothing but your neutron right so basically I'm converting a proton to neutron and that is why there's a positron emission taking place whereas if I have to convert a neutron to a proton now neutrons are neutrally charged and I want the neutrons to be converted to proton right so I'll do beta minus emission so in this particular case I'm going to do beta minus emission okay beta minus emission means i am basically taking out a negative charge or you can say it's equivalent to taking out an electron okay so i am taking out minus one charge so if i take out from a neutron minus one charge so new let's say neutron comprises of lot of things okay a neutron comprises of lot of things so if i am taking out from a neutron negative charge okay uh, again i'll explain you this concept with the help of quarks okay i'll try and explain you this concept with the help of quarks that will be easier for you to understand so a neutron like i told you comprises of two down quarks and one up quark so if i convert one of the down quarks of a neutron to a up quark i'll get a proton right so proton had this is a proton two up quarks and one down quark and your neutron is this two down quarks and one up quark so if i convert one of the down quarks to the up quark i'll get a proton so in beta minus emission nothing is happening basically you are taking out an electron or a negative charge from the uh, neutron so if i take if i take out negative charge from the neutron uh, it will become suddenly positively charged right so from any species if you take out the negative charge it will become positively charged right obviously 
it's basic logic right i do not have to explain this so if i take out uh, a, ne a negative charge from a neutron it will convert into positively charged proton so this is the way i can convert from neutron to proton and this was first done experimentally uh, sorry first done uh, theoretically and theoretically we predicted that for the magnesium compound i'll write down again 23 mg 12 11 where the number of neutrons were less than the number of protons there was a positron emission that is that is to convert your protons to neutrons positron emission means taking out the positive charge so if i take out the positive charge the proton will con get converted to neutron and if the proton gets converted to neutron then we'll op we'll obtain a value which is equal to one that is the stability value that it lies in the stability corridor for these compounds the n by z value should be equal to one whereas if i talk about neon over here in neon the number of neutrons are more so somehow we need some kind of emission which converts your neutrons to protons to arrive at the uh, n by z value of equal to one because here the n by z value is equal to 1.3 so how can we convert the neutron to a proton with the help of beta minus emission that is taking out the negative charge from the neutron to make it positively charged that is to convert neutron to a proton and this is exactly what was found out that this element it it it, it, uh, it uh, radiates beta minus emission and this particular element this magnesium compound it eliminates or it emits sorry it emits beta positive or positron emission right so this is actually one of the useful ways by which you can predict the answer to a particular question so sometimes you can be a given you can be given an element and they can ask you that what kind of emission is this element likely to show and they can give you four or five options right then you have to predict the correct option and this is the way you can do that right so i hope you found this video to be beneficial to you you found this video if you found this video good beneficial for your understanding or for your exams uh, just give it give it a big thumbs up and do subscribe to my channel and do share my channel so that more and more people do come to know about it and it also keeps me motivated like right so do subscribe to my channel do share it and do give give give, give this video a big thumbs up so thank you so much